All right. Um, well, I'm going to go ahead and kick things off. Looks like we've got a, a good majority of people logged in. Um, just for the record, we have the video disabled for attendees today just so we can record this session um, and it makes it a whole lot easier for editing and then making it available to you later. Um, my name is Mark Nelson. I'm with Independent RX Consulting. Um, I'm going to be the moderator for today's session. We are in a pharmacy trends and valuation webinar and we have a number of panelists with us. We have Bob Grohl with First Financial Bank as well as Bo Garman with First Financial Bank. We also have Rich Danhoff and Owen Bondron with Independent RX. Gentlemen, if you want to take a minute just to introduce yourselves very quickly, get rolling. Well, I'll, I'll go first since I'm the old guy and I'm going to take longer than anybody else. Uh, uh, first of all, I, I just want to thank you uh, for having me here. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, just a few um, um, comments about myself. I'm a former pharmacy owner. Um, I was on the board of pharmacy in California for a term. I developed RX ownership for McKesson, uh, which is now in the capable hands of Chris Sella. Um, I served a term as managing director uh, for pharmacy lending at First Financial Bank. Uh, currently, I work as a consultant for First Financial Bank. I host uh, Pharmacy Insiders on the Pharmacy Podcast Network. And I work with uh, independent RX consulting to assist owners who are considering selling or maybe in the process of selling. So thanks again for having me here. Absolutely. Bo? Yeah, hard to follow that one, Bob. But uh, yeah, Mark, thanks for having us. Um, glad to be with you guys today. Looking forward to it. My name is Bo Garman. I'm a pharmacy lender with First Financial Bank. I've uh, been working here for the last 10 years, working exclusively with independent pharmacy owners and potential owners. Uh, to help them with their financing needs. You know, we've probably, we've, we've transitioned hundreds of, of pharmacy acquisitions um, and, and helped to finance those. And hopefully today we can provide some insight on how pharmacies are valued from a bank's perspective and um, really looking forward to the discussion. And Mr. Danhoff. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. My name is Rich Danhoff, and I'm a partner here at Independent RX, and I oversee the ongoing portion of our business, which is accounting, taxes, and operational support. Uh, before that, I was partners with a couple others in a group of pharmacies that we owned across three stores or three states, multiple stores, uh, bought and sold probably 30 plus stores over the years, over 15 years that I, I was in that side of the business. Prior to that, in a big tech company doing mergers and acquisitions and got my start initially as a CPA in one of the big public accounting firms. So that is me. Right. Last but not least. Last. Not least, though. I'm Owen Bondurant. I'm also a partner at Independent um, RX. And I've been in the pharmacy business all my life. My dad, dad owned and was a partner with Rich um, and Tim Clark on. Uh, they owned up to, you know, almost 30 pharmacies at any given point. Um, I actually own uh, pharmacies now myself. And, you know, my concentration at Independent RX is helping people buy uh, stores. And so if I helped about 75 people buy stores, which uh, lends into the whole valuation side of things. Awesome. All right, um, just a couple quick housekeeping. So for anybody that's um, in attendance now or has just joined, um, we are going to do this in a conversational format. So the first 30 minutes is going to be kind of discussion amongst the panel with some questions that we've prepared. Um, I encourage any of you to type questions into the chat box. The second half of the meeting, we will field those questions um, and throw them to the panel. For anybody that if we don't answer your question, we will keep track of it. And so we will potentially reach out to you and, and answer it directly or record a, a video that answers it and make that available. The entire session itself is being recorded. So within about seven days, we'll have that hosted. So if you miss anything or, or have to step away for any reason, um, you'll have access to that in the next week or so. 
Um, that being said, um, we can go ahead and, and get started. Um, everybody ready? Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. All right. So again, our topic today is pharmacy industry trends with a focus on valuation. Um, Owen, kind of kickoff question. There's several different ways that you can value a pharmacy. In your experience, what are the most common ways of valuing a pharmacy that you see? Yeah, so you know, we see three primarily. I mean, there's a lot of them. I mean, you know, I've seen claims up to 30 different ways to value a business or a pharmacy in general. We see three primarily. Um, two of which are most often used. The third um, is kind of general, so it's not as kind of, it's become less relevant because of that. Um, so the first is a multiple of EBITDA, and so taking the EBITDA times a multiple. That's most commonly used by individual buyers or private buyers in general who are looking for what the profitability of the business is. Uh, the second one that is most commonly seen is taking a placing a dollar value per prescription filled annually. Um, so, like for example, if you have filled fifty thousand prescriptions and you assign ten dollars a script to those, it's five hundred thousand plus inventory. Uh, that's most commonly used by the chains or in a file buy situation. And so, those are the two most common. The third one is a percentage. Sales. We see this a lot with people who are looking to sell. They kind of take a percent of their sales and say, "Yeah, my pharmacy's worth about X plus inventory." Um, it 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 is a good kind of starting point, but it's so general and doesn't bring in the other factors that you know a lot of buyers aren't looking at that. So those would okay. be the most um, three. I don't know and, if you guys have comments to that or. Well, I have one question for anybody that you know. You use the term EBITDA and. Just for anybody who is not familiar with that, um, Bo, you want to explain what EBITDA is to the group? Yeah, I can take that. So EBITDA stands for earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Uh, it's really a measure of the cash flow of the business. Um, and it's calculated by, calculated by taking the, the net income before taxes, adding any interest on the long-term debt, uh, depreciation, and amortization. Now, in most cases, you'll want to make adjustments to that and, and what we call a normalized EBITDA. Um, and you do that by adding back any, any non-recurring or non-typical expenses or any uh, expenses that are related to the seller and not to the business. And again, that would result in a, a normalized EBITDA or adjusted EBITDA. And uh, I know, you know, Rich and, and Owen, you may have some color. On it and you, you can do it now or later, but talk about... Um, the add backs and, and, and what to look for there. Um, but in, in that formula that Owen was speaking of, you know, typically we, a good starting point would be EBITDA plus or times three uh, is a, a multiple. That's going to go up or down depending on, you know, what the actual business looks like and how it's performing and margins and things like that. So um, I would say that's a good starting point. And I think, you know, from my side to just add, Add to what Owen said, when, when you're looking at uh, different methodologies and, and you've got different buyers, and when you're looking at independent pharmacy buyers, they're typically looking for cash flow, right? They're buying cash flow. They're buying a business because it's going to give them a return on their investment. So they're looking at the cash flow. The chains or somebody that's doing a file buy is, you know, they're not worried about your complete P&L and, and the performance of your store. They're looking at the scripts that they're buying. So that's why the two different methodologies and the EBITDA method is um, is very common. The banks are using it and that that's what we usually start with. It is a historical look at the business. So it's how has the business performed up until this point? So it's really important, obviously, to have good financials that you can get to the good net income number before, and then add back the depreciation, amortization, um, and interest. So you got to have good financials in place. One other method that we typically go through when we do a formal valuation of a store is discounted cash flows. And you see that more. That's a very common method uh, used when you're doing you know, large transactions and uh, more sophisticated buyers. So 
and what discounted cash flows does that's a little bit different from the EBITDA. In the EBITDA, you are looking at historical financials and saying, okay, here's our EBITDA as it sits today and what's three times EBITDA, right? And there's a valuation plus inventory. With the discounted cash flows, what we do is we typically say, let's look what the business is going to do going forward. So it's a forward projection. And so we can look and say, you know, we think the business is going to improve by certain increments or potentially decline by certain increments over the next three or four years. And so we get both the historical perspective from the, the EBITDA method, and then we use the discounted cash flows, which has certain parameters that are a little bit different than, than just using straight EBITDA. And we, we push that forward. And then we take those future dollars that the business is going to drive and we pull them back and we discount them back to today's value. And that's how we determine value. And then we typically add inventory on top of that. And you'll see that commonly if you've got a strategic buyer like private equity, um, large groups that maybe are looking to a hospital is going to do discounted cash flows without question. And so, you know, if you've got large buyers like that, that they're going to look at that, especially if you're a seller, you may want to be aware of that. We definitely will, but even small stores that come to us and ask us to do evaluation, evaluation is, you know, part spreadsheet exercise and it's part, you know, art, right? There's, there's got to be experience that comes into the equation that helps you decide, you know, what is the multiple of EBITDA that we're going to use? What is the value per script that we're going to use? What is the discount that we're rate that we're going to use? So there's kind of the science of the deal and the art of the deal. And so you know, making sure that you you go through those calculations and then apply the right uh, the 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 right factor to it is, is kind of the key to, and that's where experience comes in. And you can't. So if I could, if the, I could jump in for a second, I yeah. I just want to um, uh, talk to um, uh, Mark Owen and and Bo to some degree. Um, my experience over the years in working with uh, owners, especially the owners that have owned the store for 25, 30, 40 years, um, they've built the store up over those years uh, from nothing or um, low, low um, numbers up to um, millions of dollars. And their opinion of what it's worth uh, seems to be a lot higher than any valuation I could do for them. Um, it, that's a real challenge in trying to let them know that what they're thinking about and what the actual valuation is are two different things. And um, so, you know, one of the things that I've always told them is once you get a valuation done by professionals like um, uh, Rich or, or, or Owen or, or Bo, um, you have to step back and look at your business as a business, not as your baby. And uh, that's, that's a real challenge in getting them to, yeah. stop thinking about it the way they've thought about it for all these years. So um, I know you guys have experienced that and, and that's a, that's a challenge in, in talking to people. Yeah. And that's one of the uh, kind of segues into the next question. So, you know, we, we talk with people on a daily basis that are looking to either get into the business and, or some people are looking to get out um, sweat equity um, you know, thinking of it like their baby is pretty common amongst everyone that I speak with. Um, I also get a lot of people that ask, what are some of the factors that influence valuation that they can control easily? Hmm. Well, one of the things that I always talk about um, with uh, perspective, perspective sellers is to take a look at their business kind of like a, a real estate deal. Um, you know, when a house is sold by a, by a good realtor, they'll stage the house. They'll go through and move things around. You know, they want to make it look really good. So when you walk in, you go, wow, this looks great. Well, you have to do that to your store, too. Um, when when um, um, we work with someone and you look at the store, um, it has to look good. Uh, you have to look at the carpeting. You have to look at the light fixtures. It has to be well stocked. It has to be clean. The employees have to look good. So, you know, it's kind of staging is one of the important things that, that can, I think, affect your evaluation. Uh, uh, Rich or, or Owen, what do you think on, um, does that does that affect your evaluation? 
think it affects the emotional side of the buyer. Yeah, I mean, just like real estate, right? If you go in and it looks all nice, I don't know that you need to necessarily like redo the inside, but you know, decluttering it, making sure the lights, like you were saying, that the carpet's clean, like those things matter and it, it will it will drive people to go with a higher multiple because they get emotionally attached to it for sure. But at, at the core, I mean, just as you're doing good housekeeping on the outside, I mean, those financials have to be clean and understood, right? So if your financials are really messy and you've neglected that for years and now you want to negotiate with the buyer and the buyer has to take them to bow. And um, so you do need to do some housekeeping on your financials and make sure that you understand that they're accurate and that you understand what's in them. If you're running your own personal expenses through there, those are what's called ad backs. So we need to identify those because they're not a detriment to the business. They, they may make your results look bad or worse, but you can add those back. So you, you got to understand the fundamentals of the, and, and have good clean financials in order to be able to take it to a bank and, and, and someone like Bo and Bo can probably talk about that. Yeah. I've just, uh, you know, touching on those ad backs, certainly we, we take those into account, but um, you know, I would be mindful that it needs to be something that we can account for on a, on a financial statement or a tax return. And it's not just the, you know, the seller saying, I you know, I put $5,000 a month in my pocket in cash or something like that. So um, they do need to be identifiable and, and validated. And uh, Rich, you, you've mentioned several times, uh, you know, you have to have clean financials, which I agree totally with. And, you know, they, they um, accountant per, uh, prepared financials are the best generally, but um, you both mentioned uh, several times when you're doing uh, valuations, um, it's um, whatever value you come up with plus inventory. If your inventory is not accurate, your financials aren't accurate. Is that true, Rich? Well, I think that's, you know, one of the hardest things in pharmacy is to get a precise inventory within your pharmacy system, right? Because you're dealing with rebates and you're dealing with all kinds of returns and all the different things you're buying from secondaries, you're buying from primaries. So you've got all this activity and getting your pharmacy system inventory to accurately reflect what you actually paid for it is, is, is a very difficult thing. And so to Bob's point, if you're, when, when you're looking at financials, the first place we look is the balance sheet. And if those are verifiable items, right? Inventory, cash, receivables, what you owe your wholesaler, what you owe your bank or, or whoever you've borrowed from, those are very verifiable items on your balance sheet. So we clean your balance sheet first and all that flows through the P&L. So to Bob's point, if your inventory on your pharmacy system and is reflected in your books at 500,000, but your actual inventory is 200,000, then your PL is wrong, right? So if your inventory is wrong, then your PLs and your net incomes are wrong. So you got to clean your balance sheet up. Make sure you have the key pieces like your your receipt, understand your receivables, your inventory, uh, your your debt structure, and then that'll flow to the PL. And then the PLs uh, should be clean as long as we have, you know, like Bob said, you know, good inventory. Yeah, I mean, I just thought of this, but like. You know, you can stage your house and make it look real nice, but and it'll get buyers really interested. But if they all find out that you have a crack in the foundation, you know, they're and the financials are that crack, right? And so if those are clean and, and they're easy to understand and they look good, well then it it gets them even more interested. So you've got to have that. I mean, in the end, it's about a return on investment and you can't get financing without it. So um uh, yeah, I think that's the key. Ninety percent of people buying pharmacies need financing, and and financing doesn't get approved without you know a, a proof of cash flow that there's cash flow in the business to support the debt payments that you're going to have to make. And we see all the time, like you know, we'll get financials where the inventory hasn't changed in four years. Right. Right. It's been four hundred thousand every single year, like on the dot. Right. Or the AR is 200 grand every single year. It hasn't fluctuated, hasn't changed. Well, as we know, it changes every day, right? So um, that begins to lower the trust of what we're looking at um, or, or a buyer's looking at. And as a buyer, you've got to question that. 
um, in terms, and it'll factor into the valuation. Um, and, and how it factors into evaluation, you guys, is if the financials, you can't trust the financials, well, now you've got to build in some room for air, right? And so you've got to come in with a slightly lower value because you don't know quite what you're getting. And so that lowers the, the valuation of the pharmacy. And, and I'm a big proponent of perpetual inventory. Um, uh, it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work and I've done it. It takes a lot of work to convert a store to a perpetual inventory and, and auto gen orders and all that. But the benefit from it, once you do that is huge. And so that's why I mentioned inventory because it's key to your financial statements but if you take if you spend the time to actually um, integrate a perpetual inventory into your system, the benefits down the line are are are, are huge to you. Bob, that brings up another point um, around valuations. You know, just like staging your you know fixing light bulbs and cleaning your carpet, but good processes like already having perpetual inventory, having updated technology, um, using. Reconciliation you know, service to using a reconciliation service, you know, in current all those processes. I mean, we see a lot where owners are still doing data entry, like that. You know, your young pharmacist is not used to do, doing that, and so having good processes also is it, it makes it more valuable because there's less change that has to occur. Um, so, uh, yeah, and absolutely perpetual inventory is a must in today's world. Um, and, and again, we know that you're never going to be precise down to the dollar on your inventory. But what we're trying to get to is materially correct. So if, if you've got a $200,000 inventory and you're off by $5,000, that's not material. But if you're off by fifty dollars or $60,000, that's a big problem, right? So getting your inventories materially correct is a pretty important part. And, and if you think going back to you're sitting at the verification station, if you don't have perpetual inventory and you don't know what you paid for your cost of goods for these drugs, then how are you dispensing and knowing if you're making any money, right? So it goes back to daily operations, but it also goes back to your balance sheet and ultimately determining value of, of, of the store that you've built. Um, and, and on that point, so you've all touched on it a little bit already. Um, the question has come in directly to me three times now, so I'll, I'll go ahead and put <laughs> this in. Um, if I was considering getting a valuation done on my pharmacy, what type of documents would I need to prepare? What are you looking for? I think that's a Rich and Bo question, is it not? not? Yeah. yeah. From our side... <laughs> No, oh, so we, you know, typically when we work with the bank, we don't do the actual valuation. Similar to buying a house, once the contract comes in and the loan's approved, we send it yeah. off to a third party for a, to to do that valuation. You know, typically what we send them is is the last three years tax returns, uh, most in, recent income statement, balance sheet, uh, and then you know we type up a, a a credit narrative that we send to them, kind of tells the story about what what's happening, uh, and that's. That's the nuts and bolts of what, uh, you know, oftentimes they then contact the seller with additional questions um, about, you know, maybe uh, inventory or uh, payroll, uh, staffing, things like that. Yeah, and from our side, you know, we do those valuations. We oftentimes don't get exactly what we want, but I would prefer to see, um, you know, current financial statements so that I can look at the last 12 months running. So I get a good calendar view of, you know, a full 12 months because the business is seasonal, right? There are ups and downs throughout the year. So I want to see the last 12 months uh, of activity from financial statements, um, from prescription summary reports off your pharmacy system to see what the script volumes are doing. Are they growing? Are they shrinking? Are they, you know, what are they holding steady? So where are your script volumes? So we want to see those. Like Bo said, we'll want to see the last tax returns. We'll want to see the the financial statements related to those tax returns. We usually try to tie those out and make sure that your book income on your tax return equals what you said your book income was. If it doesn't, we'll probably need to explain that, right? But we want several years worth of data because we want want to look at the trend. We want to look at the trend in your scripts and we want to look, look at the trend in your financials. And if your scripts are growing and your financials are improving, then, you know, 
that gives us uh, you know, a case to say, this is worth a premium, right? This is a good store, it's growing, it's got you know, good script volumes and, and so forth. If it's trending downward, it's going to be a little more challenged, and so we've got to we've got to build a story as to why and 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 try to try to examine that. But we need that's the data we generally need to be able to do that. The other things that are good to have um, to get a real accurate is like top 100 or 200 drug reports by revenue and by um, RX suspense, top 20 payer insurance payer reports by revenue and by RX and top doctors um uh, you know like who you're working with and the reason i say that is you know if there's any kind of concentration risks or mm -hmm. um, a particular drug that's making up all the profitability and that creates risk and that can affect the valuation or vice versa for that matter you know if you're doing half compounding for example yeah. it might drive up your valuation because the margins are higher and and we can explain why those margins are are higher. So, um, you know, outlining if you've got any kind of mix of business, compounding, long term care, specialty. I mean, like 340B. providing three forty B. You know, providing reports on that um, will help that valuation be more accurate and and uh, within that. Yeah, once you dive into long term care and three forty B, we'd also want to see those con contracts, right? So, are there contracts in place? Well, you know, what are the outs on those contracts? What's the risk, you know, associated with long-term care business is great. It generally drives a better margin. It's attractive, but it also can go away a lot quicker than, you know, regular retail business where you lose them one and two at a time in, in long-term care business, you can lose, you know, 30 beds or more at a time. And that can be a big risk factor when you're, when you're looking at that. So long-term care business has has better margins. And so we like that business, but it also gets a higher risk factor associated with it. So uh, just because of the of, of the nature of the business. And if you do any kind of major OTC to details on that, like what are the right. sales, yeah. what are the profit margins? Because occasionally we come across a store doing, you know, a million dollars in OTC and it's like, okay, that's great. But what is it, right? Mm -hmm. um, is that vitamins? Is it liquor? <laughs> yeah. You know, we've seen liquor and beer before, whatever it may be, um, and that can factor into things. So just if there's anything unique outside of the prescriptions, you know, get details on that. The questions that I get all the time when I when when you're talking to a, an owner or looking uh, for evaluation is, well, we're not doing compounding now, but we could. And, and we're not doing 340B now, but we could. So the potential is there. So the valuation is higher because it can happen. How do, how do y'all handle that in your valuations? I know pretty much um, when I do them, um, it, it's not a, not a huge factor because um, things that you haven't done, they're not on the books. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and, and the numbers really tell the whole story. So. But buyers are typically, or they should be looking at buying and paying for the business as it stands and and for for where it is today and then those are called synergies so they may look at synergies especially in a discounted cash flow model where you're looking forward where you're forward looking and saying okay what can this store be you know two three four five years from now but that's for them to evaluate and say okay if i buy it at x i can make it worth x plus something because i can bring compounding to the table well and i know i can drive 80 percent margins and count in my compounding business right so but that's, you, gen, you generally don't pay for synergies. The things you bring to the table as a buyer, you typically don't pay for. And likewise, to the same, if, you're, if you've owned your store for 30 years and you're paying 100% medical and you're paying your technicians 25 or 30 bucks an hour and you're giving everybody five weeks of vacation and that's what's driving the cash flow on your business down, those are often things that you need to think about, not at the time of sale, but years in advance to say, yeah, okay, I've got yeah. to start cleaning some of this historical stuff that I didn't need the money. The, the business was making great money. So I just was very generous. Well, the new owner can't afford to be that generous, right? So to sell your store, sometimes you've got to do cleanup and you can't expect the new owner to go in and clean up. I can't as a new owner step in and all of a sudden take everybody's pay grade down 25%.
So, and we've had to do that when we bought stores where we talked to owners and we said, talk to us in six months, but these are the things we need you to go take a close look at and fix. And if you can fix those and your people stay and we still have the script volume that we have today, we will then buy the store for, for that amount. But we weren't willing to pay for it at the time. And to their credit, that's exactly what happened. Six months later, we bought that store at the price that we had negotiated, but we weren't going to do the work of uh, all the hard work of well, adjusting we would, salaries. Or, or yes, or we'd have to deeply discount the store, assuming some serious risks. Employees could quit. Employees quit. We lose, um, we lose script volume. You know, patients are unhappy, so forth. Um, so from a, a time standpoint, we are a little bit over the halfway point. Um, I'll give everybody 30 seconds to a minute. If you have any closing comments or if you want to add anything to the previous topics, um, and then we'll jump into fielding some of the questions that have come in. Bob, start, start with you. Anything to add on there? No, I think we've, uh, uh, you know, it was very conversational and we've, covered a lot of uh, ground. I'd like to hear what questions are coming in now. I've seen a few pop up at the bottom of my screen. So um, uh, it'd be interesting to uh, see, see what, see what you have there. Yeah. Well, I've got them coming into, I think some are going to everybody. Some are coming just to me, but I've got them all aggregated here. Um, so one of the questions that we got first um, is actually one of the topics we had mentioned before with PPP, EIDL, um, COVID shots, COVID boosters, um, how are we factoring that into valuations and or does it factor in at all? Does it influence it? Um, so PPP and EIDL, well, EIDL is a loan, right? So it typically is sitting to the side and won't really impact things. Um, PPP needs to be, you know, a lot of people are adding that as income. And so uh, it needs to be drawn back out because it was a one-time event. Um, so it should be taken out of the revenue and, and, and net income because um, it's not going to have something to have in the future. The one that gets a little bit more tricky is the vaccines and mm -hmm. actually to add on to that COVID testing um, because, <laughs> I mean, we all keep saying it's going away. Um, but doesn't it's seem not. to be. Uh, um, but like, if you look at the last, I don't know, six to eight weeks, the COVID thing has been crazy. Mm -hmm. And we have seen, I mean, you know, when those boosters hit, uh, you know, people were doing 10,000 boosters at their pharmacy at a profit of 36, sometimes more dollars. Up to 44. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so, and it's a hundred percent gross profit. So, you can't account for all of that. Like it's not, you know, going back to our EBITDA, like, you know, we have to back that out because it's not going to occur at those rates in the future. That being said, I mean, um, there is some of that that's going to continue and it's also opened up other doors. Like, like a lot of people doing testing or doing flu and strep and these other things that we're seeing as reoccurring revenue. Um, so you've, but you're going to have to discount what 80% of that. I mean, yeah, uh, you know, to Owen's point, the stuff like the PPP, it's a one-time event. We're always looking through your financials and scrubbing things for the one-time events, either pluses or minuses and backing those out of the equation. Cause we're really looking for what's your operational view of the world. Right. So, um, so the PPP is not the ideal, like Owen said, it's a loan. It's probably gonna have to get paid off at the, at the closing. So that goes away completely. But the, the vaccines, we've been leaving about 30% of vaccine revenue. Some of our stores are really heavy vaccines. And we saw the big blip probably April, May. And then we saw it come back again, November, December, right? We track all, the, all our scripts of all our stores. And, and, we're, and we also track the vaccine portion of those scripts because we want, again, know what the underlying business is without that. And then but we're not discounting it 100%. We're not taking all the vaccine revenue away because we do believe that there's an uptick that's going to continue down the road for testing and, and vaccines. So we, we keep a portion of that in. And that's, again, part of the experience, part of the equation where you just got to see it across enough stores, see it happening enough to have a good feel 
for what what we're going to use. Yeah, for example, if someone did twenty thousand vaccines, they're like that'll never happen again, right? Um, so you're going to discount, not. yeah. Hope, well, hopefully, I mean, hopefully it does actually. <laughs> I don't know which way um, I hope on that, but <laughs> but like you know, but from a profit standpoint, um, but like you know, you're going to discount that further if they're just doing like ten a week and it, it's just people coming in to get their boosters or what have you. You know, you may bring down that on the thirty percent. One of the it's things I've seen, one of the things I've seen with some of the stores uh, that I've talked to, um, and it's not a huge sample, but um, what they found is that their uh, flu vax and, and other things that they were doing um, is yeah. going up because people are discovering they can get it much easier there than they can at their doctor, and so um, going forward, that may be a, a, a good trend for them. So um, some of that you can't discount at all, I guess, but uh, and it's hard to factor it in, as you said, but. Um, there is some positive there, I think, uh, from the uh, flu vax and uh, pneumovax and things like that that they were doing. Yeah, I think people are they're, they're they're gaining patience from the busier chains that are coming in to get a vaccine. They realize how easy it is, and then therefore yeah. start transferring prescriptions. We're seeing, I mean, even at our own pharmacy, we're seeing transfers daily, like more than we've ever seen, because you know, they'll call down to CVS and it'll be. You know, oh, we'll get to you in two days. And it's like, well, I need my bed today. <laughs> um, so yeah. there is there is a lot of that, though. You're right. Jump in with the next question. Um, and this really, uh, and any of y'all can can field it. Um, what would you consider good versus bad gross margin on prescriptions when you're doing evaluation? Um. I so like that, compounding margins. I like compounding. Yeah. <laughs> do you do compounding? Um, 75%. So that gets a little tricky because I think everyone works in percentages and they really should be working in dollars. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, 20% gross margin is not the same at every pharmacy. Um, so I know that like there's reports out there that, you know, the average gross profit percentage for a retail pharmacy is like 18 or 19% or something. But 18% of what? Right. So if your average order value is a hundred dollars and you have an 18% margin, well, you've made $18 per script. Whereas if you have a normal pharmacy that has 55 or $60 and it's 18%, you know, now you've made what $12 or $11. So um, you want to look at it from a dollar perspective, not necessarily a percentage. Mm -hmm. um, but to really make money, you probably need something above ten dollars a script is what yeah. you need. Um, you know, anything above ten dollars is good. Uh, you know, if you get into fourteen, fifteen dollars a script, I mean, that's really strong. It is. Um, you know, compounding, you might see fifty dollars, forty dollars. Uh, so try to work in dollars, not in percentages would be my advice. Yeah, no, I think that's really important. One of the first things we look at when we look at a store is the brand generic uh, mix, right? To Owen's point, you, you yeah. got to look at the dollars. So if, if your brands are averaging $400 and your generics are averaging 25, you're making, you know, 60 or 70% potentially on your $25 generic, but you're making, uh, you know, five, six percent, three percent on your on your uh, on your brand. So looking at your mix of business, making sure you're quantifying it in, in terms of dollars and making sure that you're taking into consideration like DIRs. Right. So you could be six months out yet on still paying DIRs. But we've got stores ranging in from two percent to up over 10 percent on DIRs now. And we all know what what a what a big number and and how painful the DIRs are, and hopefully there's going to be some more significant progress in that in that arena. But you've got to, you know, your pharmacy system generally doesn't tell you what your DIR is. So when you're when you're pulling your numbers, you and it says you did, you know, seven percent on brands. Well, you may have an underlying four or five percent DIR as well. So getting an accurate number and and putting it in reference of dollars, not just percentages. Right, and going going back to your um, um, percentage again for a second, though, but going back to the clean financials, uh, I can't tell you how many stores I, I've seen over the years where they come in with a 35, uh, <laughs> 30 uh, percent gross profit margin. 
and they're just filling prescriptions and you know no no compounding no other uh, cash flows and it, you know um, it just doesn't work um you can't come in with a you know 25 30 35% gross profit margin if 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 uh, you're doing nothing but filling standard prescriptions so those clean financials um and applying a dollar value to the prescriptions with unclean financials doesn't work either so i i, I I hate to keep going back to that and hounding about hounding on it, but you know the clean financials are a key to everything we're talking about today. Yeah, you're right. Bob. Um, so, Bob, next one's directly for you. Um, uh -oh. So I, I, I'll uh -oh. read it. It's a little it's bit. A, is that a is that a ringer that I've got in there, or what's no, going no, on? I, <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'll screen the ringers out. Uh, um, so this one says, Bob, you mentioned that you've owned stores in the past. When selling a location, a lot of the process is mental. So what do you do to prepare yourself and your staff before starting that process? Great question. Yeah. Well, first of all, um, let me take it piece by piece. Preparing the staff, um, I'm not sure that I, I did a whole lot there because it was so confidential. Um, confidentiality is really very high on the list of um, potential sellers. Um, generally, you don't want the staff to know that you're selling because you may have some uh, defection at that point, um, leaving for other businesses or whatever. And you certainly don't want competitors to know. And uh, you, you may not even want your wholesaler to know, which is a, you know, a challenge for them. Um, so I'm not sure I did a whole lot for preparing the staff other than you know, making sure that they were wearing their uniforms correctly and everybody was clean and doing their job, you know, that type of thing um, was, you know, but that's something you should be doing all the time. Um, mentally myself was, was an issue um, after 25 years. Um, and that is, you know, um, looking at the business valuation as a business, um, not as something that I built myself. You know, I had to step away actually mentally from being the owner to being a buyer and actually doing evaluation myself based on what the business looked like, not what I thought it should be. And uh, going back to Owen saying that that, that percentage of, of uh, sales, um, I, I could have uh, assigned any number to that and, and made it, you know, look even better than it was, but I had to really, think like a like a businessman and not like 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 an owner and I, I think that's probably the biggest step that you have to take is you know actually looking at your business as a business rich you've sold stores you got anything to add to that yeah i think emotionally it it's a huge part of it right it's it's you you have your own emotional attachment to the store and owen on the other side help helping people buy stores how many deals have fallen apart at the last minute because a seller got so emotional, everything became irrational, and then it just didn't make sense for the buyer anymore. Yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. and so that happens frequently. So you do, like Bob said, have to kind of prepare yourself mentally to step away and say, hey, this is the best thing for me and my family, and I'm, I'm, I'm going down this road, and therefore, you know, I'm not going to get caught up in you know, the, the little emotional pieces and it's good to protect your people and try to preserve their jobs and do those types of things. At some point, you know, we have bought stores where the owner did let us come in and talk to the employees, you know, well before we purchased to make sure that there was a smooth transition. Because again, as a buyer, I want to make sure that those employees are on board with what's going on and that they're, so there's a balance there. Um, and, and, you know, we'll, what we're seeing now in chain deals, if you're selling to a chain, they will not sign a purchase agreement oftentimes without having a commitment of your, of your primary pharmacist. And so that puts you in a real Sometimes pickle. Technicians too, because they can't find them. Because if you disclose that, they typically don't want to go work for the chain. So, you know, all these, we've always said, oh, hey, hey, the chains, the chains pay more, but there's so many more conditions around it. There's holdbacks, there's there's, you know, securing staff, there's, you know, your wind down costs of your rent and stuff. And 
securing your location so that no other pharmacy can step into your location that brings you know that balances the scales of of being able to to sell it to an independent um and and potentially even make more money selling to an independent than you can a chain so but the emotional part of it is is, is a lot hard. yeah i know my, my you know rich tim and um my dad sold they've sold stores a bunch of times you know and my dad always says that the hard part for him is like you know being at a restaurant and someone just, you know, an old customer's like, oh, I missed you. Like, you know, I, I can't believe you had to sell. And, and, you know, you're doing the right thing for your family, but, you know, and, and you, and you worry about these employees that you've taken care of and community people and stuff like that. So just getting yourself mentally prepared that, you know, like when someone comes up, up to you and says, oh, I can't believe you sold. It's not that they're being mean or they're unhappy. It's that, you know, they really enjoyed coming to your business. Um, and they, they love that time that they got to go to your business. So, you know, getting your met your head around, you know, why you're doing it and, you know, what's going to occur in the future and, you know, talk to some people who have sold before because that can help you get your mind right around. Well, it. and ultimately what kind of sale do you want to have? Yeah. Who do you want to sell it to? How do you screen the buyers? And if you want that legacy to continue, you want those employees to still be working out of that location and, and so forth, then that may influence the decision that you have on the on the buyer. If you want to maximize your dollars, that's fine too. And but that's another you know, that's decision. A, it's a different decision. It'll have different consequences to that. And there's a lot and emotionally, of emotionally, if 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 you really are committed to keeping it. Uh, as an independent, as you as you mentioned, are you ready to walk away if the chain offers you, uh, you know, one of those astronomical offers? I, I don't know they're they're as big as they used to be, but I mean, still you here, you man. folks know you know you folks know personally. I mean, you know, you know, a big offer comes in, you may want to keep it independent as as you want, but can you walk away from a, a whole lot more money? So, I think you're right. Emotionally, you have to be prepared. I mean, when I sold one of the stores, I, I had a front, there was a front page article in the newspaper yeah. that the, the longtime pharmacist is leaving us. I mean, you know, you got to be ready to say, okay, he is, <laughs> you know, so um, you, you do emotionally have to be prepared either way. And, and Rich, as you said, you have to be, you have to decide or hey, go and said, which way do you want to go? And are you ready to go one way or the other way? And that's a hard decision to make when you're when you're sitting looking at money and and it's your future it's your retirement in many cases so yeah and you well, know, even a change. oh yeah sorry yeah, it may not work out every time but you see a lot of scenarios where the owners stay on for six months or a year and 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 you yeah. know if there's a good relationship there that that's a win-win for, for both parties you know um and that kind of helps them to transition and see Hey, they are going to take care of my patients and gives you an opportunity to say goodbye, you know, and, and introduce the new owner. So there's always that. And, and if you're that owner that's going, doing that, um, make sure you're ready to not be the boss anymore. Because the new guy coming in is going to make a lot of changes and you got to be ready to go, okay, fine. You know, we never did it that way, but let's give it a shot. So, you know, emotionally there, you got to be prepared to step down from being the boss. All right, so I'm going to jump in with another question. Now, this has come in a total of seven times. Um, I'm, I've kind of combined it to uh, make it one question, but essentially the rumor is I'm under the impression that CVS and Walgreens are not currently buying pharmacies. If so, have we seen that impact the independent market at all? Walgreens is because we just had someone sell to it. Um, Walgreens is still buying. Uh, CBS supposedly is a, well, they were supposed to be getting back in right now, but I think they, I think they're, last we heard, they put it on furlough for about two more months. They're actually negotiating deals. We're seeing, yeah. we're seeing offers being made, but they're saying I can't get a, a purchase agreement signed off by the CFO at this point. But, but so does that mean? in two weeks, maybe that'll happen or in two months, or, you know, I, I think the stores, you know, so that, that is coming into play that, you know, that there isn't the appetite and uh, with the chains that there has been 
historically. And it, but it's not that those deals aren't still out there. There, there are deals out there, but um, they're and they're doing more due diligence on them. Quite honestly, they're yeah, looking they at the payer mix, and we've seen CVS Caremark or CVS deals where they've discounted the the, the value of the pharmacy because there's too care too much Caremark business in it, <laughs> and the high DIR fees are are killing the margins. So on their own stores. I, Ironically, but there are still, I think, deals that yeah, and some of the grocery in stores, locations. Rite Aid. Um, yeah. I mean, there is, they're out there. I mean, uh, but because of that, I mean, some of the offers have come down. You know, it used to be that what I mean, almost every time it was twenty dollars a script. I mean, like it, it, that's just what it was um, filled annually. Um, but now we we see a lot more. It's a lot more erratic. You know, we'll see ten dollars. We'll see twenty-five. We'll, and there's not as much rhyme or reason to it. Um, certainly, if you've got a lot of stores in a region, that tends to be, um, you know, where they can grab all the market share. Um, that tends to be, but it's a bit more erratic. So it is affecting some of the prices that are out there, which comes back to financials and having good EBITDA and having good financials that they can understand. That's ultimately what's going to drive up the value of your business. Uh, but there's a pretty good demand on the non-chain side. And, uh, and I think yeah. a lot of that's driven by the chain jobs aren't what they used to be. So even though the returns on the pharmacies might not be what they used to be either, there's pharmacists that just want a better job, a better life, and a and an opportunity to own something. And so they're willing to get out there and, and buy these stores. And, and we are seeing quite a bit of um, private equity and strategic buyers out there. So um, that is kind of helping hold the prices in place because, you know, they have synergies and things they can add to the store. Um, and they're just looking for a good staff and a good place to start. Yeah. So we're getting like a lot of calls from those. So um, even very underperforming stores are still there's a possibility to sell them for a reasonable number just because somebody already has infusion business that they're bringing to the table or they're bringing compounding or they have a mail you know, order component or they have other things that so yeah. just because the store doesn't really cash flow doesn't mean it it's not saleable yeah. hopefully that not uh, yeah i, I yeah. have one question for um, <laughs> strategic for, for buyers first financial. Don't need that, yeah, that probably won't help you. But. <laughs> strategic buyers don't need financing, but yeah. Um, for the first financial group, um, this question is, assuming that you used a multiple of EBITDA, um, what are we seeing as far as loan payment terms? And that is read verbatim. Yeah, and so I'm going to speak in terms of SBA, because that's, that's primarily what we deal with. Um, the term on an SBA loan, if we're not buying real estate, it's going to be 10 years. Um, if real estate is involved in the deal, it can go up to 25. Um, and there's, I, don't, I want to, in essence of time, I'm not going to get into weeds with all that. But typically, if it's a real estate deal, it's, it's somewhat of a blended term, somewhere between 10 and 25. Awesome. Thank you. Um, all right. Next question we've got. Um, how are y'all managing third-party payment agreements? Is there a gap when you're buying a new pharmacy um, or how do we address that? I know that's more on the trend side per se, um, but open open to uh, Rich, Owen. Third, third party, I assume we're talking about insurance companies um, and accounts receivable. So a lot of that's in the structure of the deal. Right. So you've got to. Um, so there, there's two ways to handle third party payments between the buyer and the seller. Right. You can either buy the accounts receivable. So the payments from the third parties or the seller can keep those and you can get working capital from a from a bank. Right. So the most common. Well, I wouldn't say it's more common anymore. Uh, um, so when you don't buy accounts receivable and the seller's keeping it, you're going to have to reconcile that. So in that case, you've got, you know, the day of closing, let's say March 1st, right? Well, anything filled before March 1st goes to the seller and it'll 
will continue to go into their bank account. The thing is, though, is the buyer is probably going to have to use a power of attorney to use their insurance. So anything filled after March 1st will now go and be transferred over to the buyer. And typically, the only way to do that is, you know, give everyone access to the reconciliation so you can see when something was filled and when it was paid. And then weekly get together and go, okay, you owe me this, I'm keeping this and, and make sure you and the seller are on the same page about how that process is going to occur on the stock deal. Or if you buy accounts receivable, uh, um, you know, in that case, the, the buyer is handing money to the seller for their accounts receivable. Now there is some issues there. I don't know if Rich or Bo or both of you want to outline the issues there. Either <laughs> either way, the 30 seconds each issue, if y'all can do it. <laughs> yeah, either way, the issue is it's hard to get your hand around exactly what the receivables are. And it's really hard to get your hand, hands around what the DIRs are going to be because those could be six months out and they could be significant, right? Some DIRs, you can see them for 10 grand a month, uh, DIR fees. So um Either which way uh, you do it, whether you buy receivables or whether you don't buy receivables, it's complicated and you need to make sure you really think it, think the process through. Mm -hmm. And that's the importance of having reconciliation mm -hmm. and keeping up with your reconciliation um, so that you have a good whole uh, feel for the, rec uh, uh, the receivables number. The good thing is that maybe five, 10 years ago, probably 10 years ago, AR, you usually had 25, 30 days outstanding. So now you have, I mean, sometimes 12 to yeah. 14, 15, 16 days outstanding. So the receivables numbers aren't as big. We're getting paid quicker than we used to. So the receivables numbers aren't as big as they used to, but they're still a big part of the consideration in the deal. All right, Bo? Not much to add there. I mean, we very rarely do we see a deal come in where the receivables are part of it for, for the reasons that Rich just talked about. Um, but we, we do, you know, at that point, we would build in working capital. Um, and, and that's that's critical. I mean, you know, you want to make sure that, that you're properly funded and you have enough working capital. Okay. And I got one more that I want to throw in here. Um, how is automation and technology assessed during evaluation? Or is it? Um, Automation is probably the one to cut. Technology, again, that kind of comes back to the staging of the pharmacy. Sure. And if your technology is really outdated, like you haven't updated your pharmacy system, the phones are old, the computers are old. Like, I mean, think of your buyer. Your buyer is probably 35, and they're going to look at this stuff and go, mm, no. Oh, like we need to replace that. And so they think of it as a cost. And so it devalues your business. Automation gets a little tricky. Um, I guess it depends on how new it is. Uh, uh, but I mean, typically it's part of, I mean, this all comes back to EBITDA. I mean, right. So <laughs> um, it affects your, your profitability, right? If you have a loan on it, it's probably going to have to be paid off at at closing um and then there's a maintenance fee to that that's going to be an expense so it you know it's typically part of the deal now if you just bought the thing and you've got to pay it off uh but i mean it's still got a cash flow like you still got to be able to cover the debt so it's not like you can be like okay my pharmacy is worth 700 but i just bought this three hundred thousand dollar piece of automation well if the debt, if the cash flow can't cover the million dollars, you can't pay for it. Yeah. Um, Automation is a lot like a car. You drive it off the lot and it loses a lot of value pretty quickly, unfortunately. But it can be really valuable to your store in terms of, you know, helping with workload. And um, but to Owen's point, it comes down to, you know, the cash flow. Are they going to assume the debt or is the debt going to have to be paid off? Typically, when you buy a store, if it's a straight up retail store, and maybe there's some automation in, but 90% of the deal is goodwill. So if you're buying an $800,000 store plus inventory, I mean, of that $800,000, 700000 plus is goodwill. 
and typically, unless there's something really unique. So you're talking about when you apply a value to a pharmacy system and, and computers, to the shelving, to the, you know, the counters and the fixtures, to, uh, you know, phone systems, it, it's rarely going to be in an $800,000 store, it's rarely going to be more than $50,000, right? Um, so, uh, you know, the majority of the, what they're purchasing is the scripts, not the technology. With, with a lot of automation, since some of those are quite expensive, as you know, um, if, if you're doing an asset sale, as you said, they depreciate fairly quickly. So in a stock sale, um, from a tax standpoint, you'd have a fairly low appreciation on it fairly quickly. But on an asset sale, you can redepreciate it at a higher value. Isn't that correct? That affects your valuation to some degree, I would think. Yeah, it, it does. And, and that goes back into deal structure, which Owen touched on. Is this a stock deal? or is this going to be an asset purchase? Or is it going to be a stock deal treated as an asset purchase under a 336, 338 election? So there's a lot of, that deal structure is really important. Typically sellers want to sell stock in a stock transaction. Buyers typically want to buy as an asset purchase. Um, sometimes there's reason it has to be a stock. You, you may be in a, in a heat zone, uh, in an urban heat zone. And urban so contracts. those contracts are going to go away or there's other contracts that need to be maintained. So you, you have to buy a stock as a buyer. I'd say probably 70% of the deals are probably asset purchases. We're seeing more and more stocks because of the heat zones though. But you're right, Bob, With a, as a buyer who buys as an asset purchase, they can then write up the value of the assets to fair market value and, and then get a tax deduction. Otherwise, as a stock, they're inheriting your basis in the assets, and usually those are fully depreciated assets, so there's not much value. All right, well, we are a little bit over time. Um, still have about 65 questions that we could jump into, um, which means we have content for another session, um, but we also will reach out to um, everyone. Um, we can do follow-ups. Um, so. We are recording this. So just kind of reiterate and, and thank everybody for their attendance today. Um, we'll have this up so you can download it uh, within the next seven days or so. Everybody who attends will be receiving a survey. You will get everyone's contact information. If you have any more questions that, that you didn't send in, and then we'll also reach out to you to answer some of these as we go forward. So I know we we'll see a couple people dropping off. I want to thank everyone for joining us today um, and we will be in touch. Uh, Mark, we're gonna we, post some questions, right? If, if, there, if, if, if there's the same question was asked 10 times, we'll just record a little video and put it up on the websites and stuff. Correct, yes. But if you have any, a very specific, they reach out to you directly. Yeah, any closing statements that anybody wants to make? Um, Anything that we didn't cover, we're going to throw out there. I'll just say thank you to everybody. It's, you know, it's a pleasure for me at, at, at this point in my career to be able to work with uh, two, two really good in, in groups, uh, um, uh, First Financial Bank and, and uh, uh, Rich and uh, Owen in, in the independent um, pharmacy group. And so um, if anybody wants to sell a store, call me. And <laughs> I mean, I guess. Do you want to buy a Go Bengals. <laughs> I mean, yeah. who day? Go Bengals. There you go. <laughs> we're from oh. we're from the Cincinnati area, so uh, I had to. And if you that. want evaluation, oh, yeah. we can we can do that too. So I'll throw a plug in <laughs> at the same time. Uh, but I would thank you very much. Mark, go ahead. Yeah, I would say you know again we harped on financial statements. There are a lot of uh, accountants and <clears throat> CPAs, tax people. A lot of them don't understand pharmacy. Seek out. Some somebody that understands pharmacy. There are some pharmacy specific accountants. We're one of them. Um, I'd there's, advise you, especially if you're going into sale, there are other good ones that really know what they're doing and can be a whole lot of help for you. Uh, you know, given the, given some time, don't step into a sale without looking at these things in advance, prepare for that sale and, and get some help and make sure that, you know, every, your house is in order before you just throw it out there. I think you'll get a better return on it. You'll understand what you're getting into. You'll have a more realistic expectation uh, of, of what the what the value and of the store is going to be. Okay. All right. Well, Rich, Owen, Bob, Bo, thank you all very much 
for your time and, and expertise um, so that we, I enjoyed it and uh, look forward to the next session. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Bo. Thanks, fun. Bob. Thanks, guys. Thank you.